Science and Chemistry at Ursinus uh, College, and then received a PhD in Physical and Nuclear Chemistry from Princeton University, and shortly after joined the faculty at Rasmus, where he's been ever since. So in, this, in 1966, he also founded um, uh, Atmospheric Tower in Ragged Point, which we are now calling the Barbados Atmospheric Chemistry Observatory, or BACO. Um, this has been a site where he's been documenting the long-range transport of Saharan dust to the Caribbean, um, and looking at how this dust plays a role in climate, in the deposition of nutrients to the ocean, as well as in human health. And Joe is going to share with us today just what he's learned in his um, measurement record of African dust that he's generated. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, so, uh, oh, here, okay. Uh, good afternoon. It's a good afternoon to be inside. And I see some uh, familiar faces, and including Tom Snowden, who did all the work that you're going to see presented here. And uh, I'm, I'm just the front for all this sort of stuff. Uh, I'm going. To, I'm motivated by a, a, a meeting that was held several months ago. Uh, uh, Ramos from uh, uh, the uh, Lamont Doherty Observatory was here, uh, dealing with dust issues, and they had a small meeting. I was surprised the amount of people who were on this campus who were actually engaged in some aspect of dust research. And uh, I thought that it might be a good idea to do a recap on you know, how we got to where we are today because we do have a, a worldwide reputation in that field. And uh, what can I advance this? So something is beeping. Is, is this, let's see if this will do it. This. Is there, there must be a, a more convenient way of advancing. Oh, here we go. Okay. So uh, this is a, uh, a picture of a dust outbreak uh, in uh, June 2014. You see a dust plume extending from the coast of Africa to the northeast coast of South America. That plume is almost 4,000 kilometers long, which is the distance from here to San Francisco. And it's quite remarkable that you see a meteorological feature that's coherent over such a distance. And so that's the first clue that, you know, it's really an unusual event. And this front is almost 2,000 kilometers, which is the distance from Miami to the uh, northern tip of New Hampshire. So these are major events, and they, this is a, a, an unusually intense one, but large events are, are actually quite, uh, quite common. So, uh, and... The, we uh, are fortunate uh, to live in, in an excellent laboratory for studying dust. This is a, uh, a satellite depiction of dust distribution over the globe. And uh, this is the uh, dust belt, and you have dust being exported from all directions in the dust belt. But you see, over here, we are really in the receptor area for a lot of the dust coming out of Africa. So that makes us a, an ideal location to this is this should be this should be our research playground when it comes to a, a, a major issue in atmospheric sciences, which is the role of aerosols in climate and the role of dust in particular in providing nutrients and things of that nature. So, um, what I want to do today is just present a brief historical overview <coughs> of how we got to this point, and it's you know it's a, a, as I say it's a personal. Uh, history of, of, dust, of dust research here at this campus and em emphasize uh, develop strategies for a better coordinated program at the school and the university 
And co the comment I made that we're in the receptor area, so we're ideal for pairing up with people looking at source processes and uh, to just uh, do things which might attract, uh, uh, develop a better uh, outward uh, image so that we can attract students in this field of expertise where we have a unique capability. And also we want to broaden to consider other things such as you know, human health impacts. So uh, I'm going to talk about the role of dust in climate process today. In order to understand the dust climate picture, we have to understand what's going on today. We have to understand how dust generation is affected by climate and we have to be able to predict future climate uh, so that we can see how dust generation would respond. And in that regard, I'm going to show you, I'll give you the punchline first, and then we'll elaborate from there. So this is the monthly mean dust concentration measured in Barbados from 1965. This is the dust concentration of micrograms per cubic meter there. So you see this, this annual cycle with a peak in the summer months, minimum in the winter, and it's changed greatly over time. Uh, change, the peaks have changed, and also the, the low, the winter values have changed as well. And these major increases that occurred here are related to drought in, in uh, West Africa. So this is clearly related to climate in Africa. How specifically it's related, that's still a major problem. And this major peak here is in El Nino, which shows how uh, the dust generation could be related to specific climate variables. So the problem is that uh, this relationship between dust and climate is not at all well understood. This is a paper by Amato Evan, who looks, looked at ocean uh, land interactions and climate. And you can read this for yourself. But what he says is the models that were used in the uh, fifth uh, uh, IPCC report says the models were unable to produce any aspects of the year, year to year variability in dust from North Africa. And so there's little reason to have any confidence that we can, knowing how climate would change, how the dust output might change over time. And that same point is made here. This is from uh, Paul Janu, uh, who's a modeler at Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab. And he was involved with the IPCC fifth assessment as well. And here he's looking specifically at the models used in that assessment and their, their uh, predictions of dust variability over time, over this period from 1950 to 2010. And this is the actual Barbados dust record. So they could, they got no, those models could not generate, generate the variability that, that has been observed in dust generation and transport out of Africa. So there's a, there's a major problem. And there are a whole bunch of issues that come into play here, and uh, we won't go into those, but it, it, there are plenty of opportunities. So I'm going to give a brief history. Uh, focus is going to be uh, source, uh, focus on sources and climate, and uh, I'm going to talk briefly about our global aerosol networks, because one of the major points I want to make is that over the years, uh, we have developed a collection of well over 50,000 filter samples, which hopefully are still sitting up there somewhere. Uh, Lillian, is Lillian here? Uh, oh, there you are, Lillian, right next to Miguel, surprise. Uh, and Lillian, Lillian can tell you where every sample is because she's analyzed all of them, all 50, well, not all 50,000, but she's done a good, good bit of them. So I think that's a resource which has not been well utilized and we can make more use of it. So how did I get to a dust collector? I said, Always a question at parties, how to get to be a dust collector. Well, I got a degree in Princeton, and you can read the title, but it has absolutely nothing to do with dust, except that the thesis is sitting on the shelf, dissertation, sitting on the shelf collecting dust. So while I'm collecting dust, it has been collecting dust. And it happened to be a chance conversation at a party, and I was I did, decided I didn't want to do this sort of thing for the rest of my life, and that, that in fact, I didn't think the field would last for the rest of my life and uh, decided to get out. And I heard about some uh, work that was going on at the University of Miami at, the, at then called the Marine Lab. And uh, the fellow I was talking, the professor I was talking with was engaged in a project there. I made some suggestions and said, hey, write a note to me, sounds good, I did. 
and I, I, here I am still, you know, almost 60 years later. So uh, the, and it was an exciting place to be, and the, uh, the, the phys it was primarily a life sciences, biological sciences uh, program at that time. And these two fellows here, Chesa Emiliani and Fritz Kocha, were developing the physical sciences aspect. And you know, there were no physical sciences in atmosphere, physical marine uh, uh, atmospheric chemists. Uh, there weren't any marine, you know, really high-level marine physical chemists. And so they go out and got people like me and and Frank Malero and people like that who learned a lot or uh, quickly about the the oceans and the atmospheres. And uh, at the time I, I came here, the, the project that I originally was uh, involved with did not pan out. It's a long story. But uh, there was a lot of work going on at the time with uh, marine chemistry and marine aerosols and the fact that the composition of marine aerosols didn't look anything like uh, seawater that was bubbled, that was you know, ejected in the atmosphere. And there was a lot of interest in bubble processes, the idea that bubble ruptures it's the part of the, the, of the surface of, of the bubble is scraped off and ejected into the atmosphere in a series of jet drops, and that these jet drops will have a properties different from bulk water. And this is indeed true uh, for a number of species, surfactants, things of that nature, or just organic junk. And so people are carrying out ex bubbly experiments where they collect a, you know, a, 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 a lot of uh, seawater they bubble the hell out of for several days. They collect the spray and say, hey, it doesn't look anything like ocean water. Of course, it isn't because the, all the marine organisms have died and all the organic junk has been developed. And what they were actually looking at was just scavenging, the bubble scavenging of those particles. And so I built a bubbler and went out in the Gulf Stream. I couldn't get anything. And so uh, the, in fact, there was very little there, there is there is actually fractionation, but it's a very subtle effect for most inorganic ions, things of that nature, unless they get complex and bumped up. But uh, the important paper for me was this by Pierre Bisquet, who was with Tarikian at Yale University, working on his PhD, or maybe he was a postdoc at Yale. And uh, he published this paper. He got the collection, a large collection of core tops from the Lamont Doherty uh, uh, Observatory and did x-ray defaction of the core tops and did mineralogy uh, uh, you know, over the entire span of the Atlantic. And he came to a number of conclusions, which you can read here. But uh, one of his conclusions was that the transport of continent-derived sediment to the equatorial Atlantic is primarily by rivers draining South uh, America and by rivers and winds from Africa. Well, the only river on the west coast of Africa is the Senegal, which is a large stream, really. And so I was struck by the winds from Africa, and I thought, well, if the sediments are impacted by wind transported material, then uh, this is what really may be modifying the chemical properties of the atmosphere. And, and uh, remember, at this time, the word long, the hyphenated word series, long range atmospheric transport, was not invented. I mean, atmospheric chemistry is primarily what was going on in, South, in Southern California. So uh, I started, I decided to focus on mineral aerosols. And about that time, I learned of the work that this group was doing in Barbados. This is a park in uh, Delaney. This, this is a, uh, the, the professor, and this is his graduate student, Tony Delaney, and this is Tony's wife, Audrey uh, uh, Claire. So uh, they set up a station in Barbados. They were interested in cosmic dust, because at that time, there were satellites that were had micrometeorite detectors, which were sent through microphones inside the, 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 the satellite. These were very early satellites, you know, grapefruit size, basketball size, metal spheres. And they were detecting very high input rates, or impact rates, supposedly. Turned out it was an artifact of the thermal stressing of the shell of the satellite. But in any event, before that was recognized, they decided to set up here and filter on a day-to-day -day basis large volumes of of aerosol and uh, and then extract the ferromagnetic particles. They built this tower. It's the west coast of Barbados. Uh, this is where they set up here. This is the tower they built, and uh, this is what the way you collect the dust. These are nylon monofilament meshes, 
and then you hang it in the wind, and a tremendous amount of air goes through those meshes in the course of the day. And here, there's uh, your truly uh, 30, 40, 40 years younger and 40 pounds lighter, I think, and uh, holding a mesh that's exposed for the afternoon. And there's a lot of dust on there. You rinse it off, and there you have a large collection of dust. And if you go up, go up Lily can show you vials of dust loaded. I mean, really, lots of dust. They collect a lot of dust. So uh, I started doing dust collecting on ships, and I had two of these. These are each one square meter. And I would actually mount two on the art arm. And it looked like a square rigger flying against the, going against the wind, but it got a lot of uh, comments, but uh, it got a lot of dust as well. So they published a paper pointing out that uh, the, uh, what, what, we're, what they were seeing was windborne dust. They, they you know, said it was coming uh, Europe, Europe, from European and African continent, and they talked about the size distribution less than 20 micrometers diameter. So that was the first paper that, that really uh, dealt, uh, discovered the, the dust issue in a public way and quantified it. But the guy who really discovered it uh, was Chris Junga, who, uh, he's a German PhD meteorologist, and uh, he was working with the Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratory in uh, Boston, and he was the guy that discovered the Junga layer in the stratosphere, among other things, but he was interested in regular atmospheric chemistry and particularly aerosols and the nitrogen and sulfur species. So he studied uh, the aerosols in Boston for some time. He wanted to go to a place where the air was clean, so he went down here, uh, right down the road from us, and did some studies, long paper, uh, all primarily all, all on nitrogen and sulfur species. And there's one paragraph with this simple statement here, where over a, a several day period, he collected uh, large quantities of uh, mineral uh, reddish yellow dust and looked at the weather maps and he decided it was coming from Africa. And uh, he could recognize, among other things, he could recognize African dust because he was with the Africa Corps in the 19, early 1940s. And so he had a lot of experience with dust and forecasting dust and the like. So he had a, he had a, a background up it. He, this is a, I didn't see this until years later, it was just buried, it was not, it's not indexed. If you do it, you search on it. This is before the days of the convenient indexes we now have. So the big change came in Bomex, which was a large scale field experiment centered operating out of Barbados. They were interested in energetics of the tropical marine boundary layer clouds. And uh, they had uh, ships and they had an aircraft, the NOAA DC-6 which I was in, had been involved with for some time. I was sampling precipitation in hurricanes, precipitation chemistry. Uh, the, the sampler on the plane was originally designed to collect high altitude samples of radioactive debris. And so I started sampling regular boundary layer aerosols or tropospheric aerosols with it. And so over this period of three months, I uh, collected a series of a lot of samples and uh, and here's the here's where we found surround air layer. So there were four different periods. You can see the altitude. Uh, these are four different flights, four different periods of flights. Uh, a lot of samples, hundreds of samples. And uh, so this is the altitude distribution. And when you get into June, you start to see this this level of increase at, at this a higher level. And particularly in July, you see the same sort of thing. And this is linked to the soundings in, in Barbados, which shows a very uh, unusual layer for a, a tropical marine uh, uh, a sounding. And you have this essentially constant isopotential uh, iso temperature over here and an extremely dry layer. And this was the Saharan air layer, which has come to be recognized you know, as, as a phenomenon which is responsible for the, the the, the fact that you can transport dust over such tremendous distances across the Atlantic. So we published two papers. My colleague, Toby Carlson, who <clears throat> had just arrived in Miami, was working with NOAA, and he'd been studying uh, easterly waves, and he got very excited when he heard what I was doing, so he did a couple of papers. These papers are cited more in the past 20 years than they were cited in the first, first one. So this is what 
a dusty air layer looks like. It's uh, very hazy, the clouds are very suppressed, some of them punch up through, very flat. And the question is, why did more people say something or note something about this over all that time? That was a new phenomenon. So a lot of interest in how this, uh, the Saharan air layer modifies the, the atmosphere, the properties of the atmosphere, and uh, 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 Dunyan, Jason Dunyan across the way has written a number of papers, the first one, on the way that uh, these African air outbreaks interact with uh, tropical storms and hurricanes and tend to suppress them. And now they even have a website where you can actually look at the distribution of the, of the cell with regard to the, the tropical storms. So <clears throat> in 1971, uh, there was no power down here where we originally had the tower set up. Well, there was power about a mile away, and uh, we didn't have any money. This was, largely, this was largely bootleg. And uh, and so we went up here where there was power, and uh, we set up our first laboratory. This is our first laboratory, and this is the laboratory today. So we have our tower and these two modules, that, which are 20-foot cargo containers. This is another uh, group looking at radiative import and trace gases in the atmosphere, a gauge. So we go back to this record and uh, and say something briefly about what you know where, where this is taking us. And again, I ask you to do the math here. It's 47 years, 365 days, your daily samples, a lot of samples. You'll never see a record like that again. And this gives you an idea of the variability you know, two different years, 1998, which was a major El Nino of the, of the, in the 20th century, and, and 2008, which is a low dust year. And these are, again, daily samples. Of course, the year, this is the dust concentration by the transmission meter there. And a uh, uh, big difference between the two years. And so, you know, the driving question is what drives this variability? The other point is I have a bar here at 50 micrograms per cubic meter of air. That is the World Health Organization 24-hour guideline for PM10, and African dust is primarily PM10, 95% plus is PM10. So <clears throat> the African dust has a possible impact on health, and there's been a lot of discussion about the impact on asthma and other things, which I won't get into here. So dust and climate, this is the same data shown as annual averages, the gray bars. This is the dust, annual mean dust concentration. And the red line are the Sahel precipitation anomalies. Here's the Sahel. And uh, they're plotted as they, and this, it's on this axis here, <coughs> in centimeters of precipitation. And it's plotted on inverse scale to algebraic, algebraic negative of the uh, actual difference. So that you can see that when you had high concentrations, of, so this is drier in this direction, wetter in this direction. So you can see that the general trend of the aerosol in Barbados over that, that period, uh, 1965 to 2012 on this, this graph, is that it tracks rainfall very clearly. And the, the uh, well, clear in a general, in a general way. Uh, so the question, really, the driving question is, that the side, this is Sahel, we know there's a lot of dust coming from uh, areas up here, that the Sahara places, you know, and, and Mauritania places like that. And so the question is, why would all of that dust, I and mean, these are annual means, why would all of the dust coming out of North Africa track rainfall in the Sahel? And my zeroth order answer to that is that somehow the rainfall of the Sahel is linked to larger climatological variables, including variations of wind, wind, wind speeds, wind gustiness, uh, and, and a lot of other factors which which can yield this a coherent picture. The, we were doing other things. Uh, we had ne ocean networks. Uh, there was a CRX program uh, essentially through the 1980s. Uh, <clears throat> Bob Deuce and I uh, led that program. And we had, the strategy was to characterize the aerosol over a relatively clean <clears throat> ocean. And uh, so it was a two-pronged sort of investigation. Bob and his group uh, would do intensive field programs where they put up a tower like in Anahuitoc and, and another one in, in New Zealand uh, at, at uh, some point, or and a ship cruise that we ran through here. 
And I would, uh, and my group here in Miami, would put up aerosol samplers in these stations to get sort of a general climatology of the aerosol transport. So this is the way uh, that network operated for some time. We set up then in the 90s was another program that was led primarily from here, Eros, and uh, we set up these stations here in the North Atlantic. Uh, <coughs> and just give you a quick view of these stations because all of these stations are available for general use, I mean, with, with through prior ranges, of course. This is the Zanya Observatory, which is right off the, the Canary Islands. Here's ten, it's on Tenerife. It's on a ridge at 2,400 meters. Fantastic facility. I've been going there since the early 1970s. And uh, this is their research tower here. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful facility, and it's a, just a fantastic, I mean, it's a gorgeous location. Uh, so here, this is a satellite image just on the 6th of February showing you this huge plume coming out, and it's just skirting right by Tenerife. So it's in a very active region. This is uh, Macehead uh, Observatory, and uh, this was uh, also part of Eros with the University of College Galway uh, in Ireland. We put up this tower and there was a, a uh, we had a cargo container laboratory here that we set up as well. Then the, the, the Irish government put these little laboratories, uh, uh, directed those laboratories there, excellent facility. Uh, this is Bermuda and uh, Dennis knows this site, I'm sure. Uh, tower, we had two, two laboratory modules there, and it's at the western end of Bermuda. The idea was to look at stuff coming off the U.S. Uh, this is in, in, in Iceland. I set this up, uh, Tom and I set this up in 1991, and uh, it's at, located there. This is, we're, we're looking south. This is uh, the island of, it's a uh, western islands, and this is Jaime. And there's a lighthouse right down there, and we're set up right down. Here's the lighthouse. Here's our sampler with a few people there. And Cersei is right down there somewhere. But uh, that, that data has become, we had a paper in science uh, a few years ago. There's tremendous interest now in uh, uh, aerosol transport in the high latitudes because of the impact of lab processes, including albedo of snow surfaces. And, uh, and this is the Cape Verde Islands. This is, and we were not actually here. We were there, we set up in 1974 on Sal Island, which is right over here, a miserable little place. And uh, years later then, the, a group uh, from England and NERC has set up this site here. And we have close, we have close cooperation with all these people that I'm mentioning. And this is the most recent one, KN, uh, atmospheric chemistry program that uh, Cassie is uh, uh, primarily involved with. And uh, we have a, here's KN here. And uh, this, there's a hill on the eastern shore, beautiful site. And we're located right on the top of that hill. And that's what our typical sampler looks like. And uh, if you put all of this together, you see, this is the uh, annual, these are annual, these are monthly means over like 20 years. They're not all necessarily concurrent. Many of them are Miami, Barbados, Purdue, Miami. Uh, but you notice the scales are all different. And this is Isanya, Tenerife, which has a bimodal distribution because of the change in the way the dust it comes out of Africa over the course of the year. This is Sal Island, which gets primarily low-level dust coming out this way. During the summer, when it passes over Sal Island in the Saharan air layer, we get more dust in, in, uh, in Barbados than they get on Sal Island because of the meteorology of those individual events. So it's a very dynamic environment, and, and part of the, the problem of relating climate change in Africa and what gets transported long distances into the atmosphere and the consequent impact on atmospheric radiative properties, cloud microphysics, deposition of the ocean, is it can change pretty dramatically 
at these various sites. So it's that you have to have a good handle on how these source uh, emission and transport is all linked together. And this is several uh, ten years of data uh, uh, showing the data from all these sites, including Bermuda. And and I'm, I'm not going to go into it, but you can see changes in in timing of the start of the dust events and the when they taper off, and of course Barbados gets more than everyone else, where Mutant is very, very uh, episodical, and shows you what a large gradient there can be across the Atlantic, depending on the events and the, the conditions. So this is a satellite uh, uh, aerosol optical depth measured by the SeaWiff satellite in a 10 year period or something of that sort and uh, showing aerosols. And it's a very complex and dynamic aerosol environment in this earth. But again, the point I made before is that so much action is taking place across this, this uh, dust belt. I mean, there's biomass burning in here as well. I'm going to say about this is biomass burning down here. But it was, it, this is, so much of this is driven by dust. And the major problem is understanding what is driving that those emissions and how that changes with with time. So uh, we were very, we're very fortunate to have a, some good colleagues and we started to look at dust sources and uh, which is an interesting story how that developed, but there's a satellite, Tom Satellite, which is very good for getting absorbing aerosols. And I attended a meeting and I saw that you know, they, they had an anomaly in their return. It's an ozone modern, modern satellite but the, they monitor different UV wavelengths, and in looking at those UV wavelengths, you can see the impact of something was going on. It turned out it was absorbing aerosol, and you see patterns like this. You see here, this is their, the aerosol index, the numbers don't matter. So after that meeting, I went home and took out the Times Atlas and started looking. And these are all uh, depressions, low-level depressions uh, that were they were flooded, and they were highly vegetated, flooded in the Holocene six, 8,000 years ago. They're dry today, and uh, this is where all the dust activity is taking place. And so we put together a paper, this paper here, and we did actually the, all, all, the, all the dust sources of the world doing the same thing. So this paper has proven to be sort of a a guideline, if you want to go look at dust sources, you just pick out your spot and, uh, and uh, get an airline ticket. And this is, this is uh, the, uh, the Bible of anyone looking at dust sources and, and factors affecting dust mobility. So uh, Cassie's involved with some, one of my colleagues, Tom Gill, looking at playas and you know, uh, dry lakes, things of that sort, which are very important source. Anyhow, this first came out in this paper here. Uh, so uh, we then did another paper looking at the impact of uh, anthropogenic dust, and anthropogenic dust is dust generated in, in regions that we, we related dust activity to agricultural techniques. And that, that's a the significant source of, uh, of problems, as you, you know, the dust bowl is a classic example. And I won't go into it here, but I, again, the, the point here is that uh, to understand how dust changes with climate, we have to consider all these factors. So, uh, and and right, the question is, you know, what is it that we're missing? And that is a very, very, very major uh, topic of research at this time. And I think that we're in an excellent uh, position to become involved with those sort of activities. So, as climate changes, uh, we would expect dust uh, emissions to change as well. This is from the, uh, the IPC 2012 report. And this shows uh, soil moisture in two different time periods. And uh, the reds, is the, it shows increasing dryness, and uh, yellow is intermediate, that sort of stuff. But the gray areas are areas where the models could not agree on what the future trends in those areas would be. And if you look at where the models didn't work, it's all the areas where we get most of our dust today. So the models cannot address the issue of what is it that is 
is uh, affecting aridity in the areas where we would be most impacted by changes, those sort of changes. So, uh, and the question I raise is, you know, this sort of stuff has been seen for people have observed for years, and no, no one has really looked into it. The uh, I'll tell I'll tell a story about this one guy who actually discovered African dust before uh, Junga or before we did was uh, a fellow, a, a, a geologist in Caracas, Venezuela, who was a very curious sort of a guy with a lot of curiosity, and they have a a, a, a meteorological uh, event called the Kalina, which is a dense haze, which has long been attributed to uh, sea salt aerosol. So he started to do experiments. Uh, he got glass slides and took samples, and he got it in his car and drove up the, the mountains uh, bordering on the, 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 the Caribbean in, in, in the Caracas, and took altitude measurements, and he got, in a, got a small private aircraft and went out and collected samples there. And he describes that the fact that it was largely due to mineral dust, and that he described the properties, he said this, this material was associated with unusual meteorological conditions in Caracas, the area, the air where the dust, when dust concentrations were high, the air was unusually warm and unusually dry. And he characterized the top of the Saharan air layer at 9,000 feet. I mean, he really nailed it, except, you know, he had no way of knowing where it came from. And he, this was published as the, in the American, in, in Scientific American, they had a column, the, the citizen scientist, something of that sort, and it was edited by a fellow named Strong. And this was a letter that this guy sent to this guy Strong. So he discovered it, and he gets absolutely no recognition of it because he's invisible. I happened to read it before I had any interest in atmospheric uh, aerosols of any sort. And but uh, the, the the basic question though is, you know, this has been going on for a long time, and why didn't anyone do more about it? So I want to close up with uh, our recent activities, and uh, we in the late seventies I had a sampler in KN, and we showed that there was as much dust coming across in KN in the late winter and the spring as there was in Barbados in the summer. And uh, a few years ago, I learned that there was a, in KN they had very extensive air quality measurements because they're a part of France, or a department of France. So they do the same measurements that they do in the Place de la Concorde. So they had a lot of instrumentation and pretty boring I mean, the, the air is pretty clean there, but uh, they have PM10, and you look at PM10, and you could have, you could see the impact of African dust coming in, and this is uh, the KN daily average TOM. PM10 is a standard instrument used by air quality in EPA. It's a, a standard reference instrument, uh, a standard. Uh, uh, not the, uh, it's accepted. They're all over the place. The, and in Europe, they're used in Europe, they're used all over. There are tens of thousands of these around the world. So, uh, so these are particles less than 10 micrometers diameter. So this is a PM10 concentration. And so this is from 2002 to 2017. And you can see that every winter, you see these, the, these sudden bursts of increased uh, PM10, which is due to dust. You take all that data and plot it on a 365 day a year, you can see that seasonality very clearly. It's really dramatic, you know, in, in, in early June, it just chops off. And then you see this curious feature here, which is in September, November. So uh, 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 Cassie and uh, Ann Berkeley are, are uh, here's what we're sending in on this the phenomenon here. And the question, one of the major questions is, you know, is this, does African dust serve as a, uh, as a, as an important source of nutrients for the Amazon. A number of papers building essentially on what I did 40 years ago are speculating that this large amounts of dust bring phosphorus into the Amazon. Amazon basin, because of the rainfall, is highly leached, and so the question of you know how do you regenerate the nutrients, things of that nature. So this is uh, uh, some photomicrographs that Ann Barkley has put together, and you can see diatoms and other little fragments over here. Again, indicating the, these are freshwater diatoms, by the way. So we, the, the point is that they're that we're, we're seeing transport. Clearly, we're seeing transport from Africa. So this is a sample from KN, and the diatom fragment. This is a, the same 
the species of diatom from the soils in the Bodelli depression, which is, the Bodelli is the most intense dust source in the world, and some other of all dust sources. And so there's a lot of interest in what the output of the Bodelli, uh, how it could be impacting the, the Amazon basin. So to close up, I present a, an idea for a larger strategy for looking at dust uh, and other, when I say dust, uh, I mean, we look at, we look at, we take bulk samples and we look at everything in the sample, depending on how much we, we're interested in any particular species. And for example, we're very much interested in uh, biomass burning products. And we think that that, in fact, uh, is an important source of some of the phosphorus that we're seeing in these aerosols. So these, uh, these are stations that, that, that we're all involved with in one way or another. Uh, you see Barbados there, and there are three different types of, of instruments. Well, there are a number of different instruments, but emphasize three instruments that give us a idea of the uh, altitude distribution of dust. These are the, well, not the uh, TOM gives us the particle concentration. Uh, <clears throat> Aeronet is a sun photometer. It's a tracking sun photometer. It does aerosolological depth uh, in multi wavelengths. And the micropulse LIDAR gives us the vertical distribution of, of the dust. And uh, the, the micropulse LIDAR, uh, the newer ones, measure the depolarization ratio, which is very specific for dust. So uh, the idea is that I uh, want to develop a coordinated activity across all these sites. So the, this is the Tenerife and the Canary Islands. This is the uh, Cape Verde Island site. Uh, we have, uh, there's a Dakar site that we have contacts with, and Bermuda, of course, and these various islands here. And NASA is putting in, the green arrow supposedly is a micropulse LIDAR. So we have one here. There's one in, in Puerto Rico, and NASA is going to be putting uh, other uh, micropulse LIDARs in that region here. So in effect, we'll be able to quantify the, and characterize the vertical spatial distribution of dust and its physical chemical properties. And this will be a test bed for models and their ability to, uh, to characterize individual dust storms, how they're transported through the atmosphere and what their eventual fate will be. And built into this is an effort to understand uh, the impact on health. Uh, there is a, we have an effort uh, through the Crop Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology in Barbados now has a dust forecasting center for the Americas, so you can go and look at their site and see dust, uh, black carpet, things of that sort, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, a forecast on a day-to-day -day basis. So the idea is that uh, eventually we'll be able to uh, do forecasts and issue alerts uh, based on incursions of dust and the possible impact it might have on people with respiratory and cardiac problems, things of that nature. So with that, uh, this is a, a plan and uh, of sorts. And I think the important thing is that uh, we should, I think that this school is in a opportune uh, time, at its opportune time for the school to consider in a more coordinated uh, studies into dust and related species. I think in particular that biologicals is a, is a very important consideration. There's a lot of interest in transport of biological and microorganisms with dust. And we've done some papers on that ourselves. And the transport through the atmosphere is not kind to microorganisms, but they do survive. So the question of survivability and other factors comes into it. But I think that you know really we're we're in excellent, excellent position. And it's it's a problem that's not going to be solved soon. It's not going to go away in the near future because as I showed you, the models do a terrible, terrible job in, in, uh, in forecasting dust variability over time. And finally, one would acknowledge you know, the people that have done so much. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of people have been involved in setting up these stations. I can't believe, you know, we would just send off a telex in those days, a telex to a station and say, in effect, you know, we're interested in marine chemistry, marine aerosols. Could we set up a sampler in your backyard? Will you change a filter once a week and mail it to us? And I said, sure. <laughs> and it's amazing. I mean, all those stations you saw, most of the people were just uh, cooperating with us. Uh, two 
colleagues, the faculty members, Dennis Savoy was my graduate student initially, he was later on the faculty, and Hal Mehring uh, played a major role in the 80s and 90s and all of this in the early 2000s. And these are the people that actually did the work. <laughs> and uh, Ruby Neese was my first hire, and then uh, Tom Snowden, it was 1979, was it? 77. See, it's even further back in the ancient history. And Lillian was in the late 80s, and Miguel and, uh, and Marva, uh, Marva what the she couldn't come today, Marva was headed our office group, and she really kept everything going. I mean, you know, she, was, she was amazing. Oh, they were all amazing. And, it's been, uh, and of course, the people in Barbados over you know, this 50 plus years uh, did a, done a fantastic job. So, you know, I really owe these people, you know, the, the hearty thanks. And on top of it all, it's been fun. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. This is great. Okay, thank you. We have time for some questions. Does anyone have any questions for Joe? So, Joe, uh, you know, you showed a lot of uh, variation with time using the measurements at the sampling sites. Yeah. What can you quantify with the remote sensing? Well, we, we have uh, we we've had uh, Aeronet site there since the early '90s, and we've had a microphone lidar there. For the I mean the uh, satellites from space, looking down, optical oh. depth. Does that quantify column you, inventories? The it, it sort of, but it's it's difficult sorting out. I mean, with African dust, for example, uh, the. A lot of dust comes across the, the, the dust season and the biomass burning season. Biomass area is just south of the dust, intense dust sources. So the dust and the, the biomass burning materials get mixed together. Of course, you get a strong signal from biomass burning. So it's the newer satellites are getting better at it, but it's still, it's still a tough task. And one of the problems with the developing models is they're, they're, they validate, they, they, they test their models primarily against aerosol optical depth because there are so as few actual measurements uh, that they can test against. That's why the Barbados data and the, the data from the Pacific networks, if you go to the IPCC assessments and you see the model results, they have <coughs> University of Miami, University of Miami, University, if they credit us at all, it's been ingested into the system and a lot of people don't even know where the data comes from, but it's still the basic data set because there's no other data sets over the oceans. I mean, we had, I didn't show you, we had stations in the Indian Ocean, we had four, four stations in the Antarctic. Tom, I forget, how many do we have there? Three or four? Three, I think. Three, okay. So Tom's been, to, I wasn't joking, but Tom has been to almost all those sites you've seen there. And he can tell you what the beer is like in all of you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, so that so it's a problem that the, the real data is missing, and that's why I, you know I'm excited about the ability to use PM10 data in a lot of these areas which have relatively low local emissions. We'll be able to get a better idea of the temporal spatial variability of the dust coupled with the column measurements of aerosol optical depth and uh, micropulse lidars. So that you know that's the, the hope for the future, but the, the the satellites are really really getting a lot better. But you know, I we're I, I learned uh, uh, from a fellow that had the Miser project in NASA, I've known him for many years, uh, that we did a paper. I guess it was 1979. We, we were looking at the size distribution of Barbados dust, and it's pretty boringly uniform, except there was a period we got a relatively high fraction of particles greater than 20 micrometers diameter. These are measured by simple old settling technique, you know, you use a tube, just a geological soil analysis technique. So we looked into that event, and these were the early days of these very fuzzy NOAA satellites, and we could actually see a plume coming across, and we did a back, uh, my colleague Toby Carlson actually did a back trajectory, he didn't have high split then, but you know, just a simple adding vectors together, and, uh, and uh, so that we published a paper, and that turned out was the first paper which related a long-range transport of, of, of atmospheric constituent you know, to a specific event. So, uh, uh, so our friend Zamora is, is actually working with Ralph Kahn. You know, that's, that's, I have no oh, yeah. very good relation 
uh, with, with, with Ralph. So yeah, there's, you know, there the, what's really lacking is data. But South America, it's amazing that with all the focus on what's going on in the Northern Hemisphere, there's essentially so little work in South America. I mean, our work, the, I did the work in the late two years, the late 70s, and we did this now. There is essentially the only time series which allows you to relate a meteorological process to what what they're looking at. There are groups that have worked in, in, in the interior of the Amazon where it gets very, very, very noisy because there are so many sources of aerosol, very difficult to sort sort out the various things going on. But just very, very little research. So I'm trying to organize a group to bring together people in South America and say, look, get to work, <laughs> do something. You know, well, you know, the problem is funding. You know, that's, that's a problem. Still, we're trying to coordinate them at least if they get together, get together and present a, a strategy for why you should want to do this and how you might do it, maybe maybe something will happen. But uh, so you know, Cassie and and Anne are are putting a lot of effort into this now, and I think you know, going to great stuff. You're going to get great stuff because it's absolutely unique, I mean, absolutely unique. No 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 real solid database. So that's going to be great. Won't be easy. <laughs> it, it'll be great if we can get if we can get clearance from the, the biggest hindrance to all this is working through university. I mean, <laughs> you won't believe. Well, the hat. for two years ago they discovered how we were paying people in Barbados. They decided that was you know, we couldn't do that. We had to shut down. We shut down the operation. They allowed us to open up with all sorts of preconditions. Two years and some months later, we still do not have that sorted out. They are so super cautious, and you know, I never, I never could have done anything like I did then. Now, because there's so many, there's so many cautions, and so, I mean, you end up with a half a dozen lawyers in a room uh, telling you what you're trying to do is going to be very difficult because of legal reasons and cautions of that nature. But anyhow, we do it anyhow, so somehow or another. But it's, uh, it's been a, a great, great experience. So. Thank you, Joe. Uh, have you been able to, or have you tried to take this great wealth of atmosphere uh, data and translate that into chemical fluxes into the ocean? Oh, well, yeah, a lot of people have done that. I mean, I, I did it, started doing that years ago. And, uh, and it's the same sort of a problem with the chemical fluxes uh, because the you still run into a problem in the model. A lot of results are very model specific. Yeah, so that's that's a that's a problem, and I, you know, and given the problems we have to modeling dust today, I am awed at the bravery or the uh, maybe lack of caution of the people that are trying to do paleoclimate, because you know it's 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 it's, it's not to diminish what they're trying to do. They're, you know, they're they are they're doing the best they can in the circumstance, but it's really really tough, given the fact that. You're so source dependent and so dependent on the control of having an understanding of control of meteorology because what you're really interested in is that what's going on at the surface. So 10 meter winds don't necessarily give you what you need. And unless you have a detailed knowledge about the surface, uh, as I showed in that figure, that, you know, there are very specific sources. And a lot of times satellite images, you, know, you can see individual spots. My moment of revelation was driving I-25 out of Boulder in the fall of 1996, and it was a, there was a wind coming off the front range, and driving down the road, I was driving normal to the, to the front range, and there was agricultural crops were all cleared in. They were just stubble in the fields. Apparently, all the they all were pretty much the same. The field on the left was blowing away like crazy, and the field on the right couldn't care less. And then driving up to Fort Collins, where I had to give a lecture, you see that all over. I said, "My God!" I said, "How do you ever, how do you ever get control? How do you ever put this into a model? I mean, the specificity, of what you need. I mean, can a model tell you that this field's going to go and that one's not? And you know, that's the level. And that's why when I saw the toms, that uh, I thought, "Wow!" So, uh, but that's 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 a problem. 
It's really a problem. And that's not going to be resolved easily, but it means we'll be out of work for a long time. <laughs> Okay. Thank you.